Hi. In the previous video, we discussed how you can have subword embeddings and how that might be beneficial in certain use cases. In this video, I would like to delve into being a little bit more specific about which subtokens we like in an attempt to save a whole lot of memory. And to get the ball rolling, I figured I'd write some words down, and then we can start talking about which n-grams might really matter in this case. So looking at the words on the left, I'll just start writing down a couple of subwords. So I've only taken a subset of the n-grams, the first couple of characters for astronomy, astrology, and the same thing for topology and topography. And when looking at this, I can somewhat come to the conclusion that maybe I can ignore these as long as I have this one. Astro as a whole will tell me that it's about astronomy or astrology. And maybe if I know that astro is in the word, well, then maybe I don't need AST, ASTR, and ASTROL. And if I think about words like topology, topography, topologist, well, then I think the TOPO part is going to be the most important. And we might be able to forego all of these. But it's not just at the beginning of a word that we see this phenomenon. We also have it at the end of the word. If I were looking at words like topologist, then maybe... I can suffice if I just have this part over here. And if I think about language, then I hope you recognize that this phenomenon of words being built up of different subwords, and that we might get these morphological meanings going, that's actually quite common in a lot of languages. If I look at the word geologist, well, there's this ist at the end, and this geo in the beginning, so it's probably a person who studies the earth. And if I were to consider how much memory I might be able to save, how much more lightweight we might be able to get, well, this can be a nice strategy. Considering all the potential n-grams of a word that could exist, I hope that you would agree that if we have an intelligent mechanism of selecting just a subset of all of these n-grams, then we might still be able to capture a lot of the language meaning while saving a whole lot of disk space. And thinking about fast text in particular, it will be nice if we have some tactics such that we don't need the seven gigabytes on disk. So let's explore how we might go about finding the special subwords, the ones that we are interested in. Because if we have a good approach for this, then we might also have a nice approach for new word embeddings. So what I'm going to do now is just demonstrate a heuristic that we can use to find these special subwords such that we don't have to memorize all of the engrams. Now, what you see here is the words that I had before. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to select a subset of them, maybe astronomy, geology, and let's say geologist. And what I'm going to go ahead and do is I am going to split them. So what I've done is I've taken my words and I've split them up such that I have separate letters as well as an end token at the end. And let's say that I do this for all of these words and not just these three. Uh, but I'm only drawing these three because it's more practical. Well, what I can now do is I can say, well, let's look at all of these characters that appear in a sequence, and let's count how often they happen. So what I'll do is I'll just assume that all of the words on the left-hand side, are, that that's my training data, and I'm going to keep track of a Python dictionary, so to say, that is going to count, hey, how often do I first have the letter A followed by the character S? And then I have a pair that appears together. And what I can then do is I can count how often they appear together. And let's say that we have three. These two appear three times. And uh, I do this for all of the pairs that follow in sequential. So I should also have O and N. Let's say that happens twice. I might have G and E, S and T, all the way down to Y, and then this end token. And let's suppose that these are the counts that I have for all of them. Well, then one thing that we might observe is that the pair that occurs the most frequently, well, that's this one. It is the Y followed by the N token that we see quite often. Well, let's say that this indeed are the counts in our data set and that we indeed have a long collection of words on some arbitrary corpus that we're training on. Well, then we could argue here that maybe because these two characters occur so often together, that they should be merged. 
And that means that we can go back to our sequences and we could say, you know what? We're going to combine these two together. They appear so often together that we might as well just consider that to be a single token. That's what we're proposing here. And well, what I can then do is I can actually make that change actively. So I'll just erase this. And I'll have a new token here for Y and end together. Now, because my definition of characters that I can use as tokens has changed, but also because my sequences have now effectively changed, this will mean that I'm going to have to recreate this dictionary again. So that means we're going to count everything again. And some of these counts actually won't change. So the original A and S pair, that's bound to still have three examples in it. But what might be different now is that the next pair that has the most counts, well, that might not be Y and end, but that could very well in this case be G followed by an E. And let's say that there are seven counts of that occurrence. Well, what would happen now is we would again say, ah, that's an indication that we can make a new pair. And that means that I can put these together. Now, if we repeat this a whole bunch of times, odds are that because geo occurs very often in our word list, that we might get this single token that represents geo. And you might similarly also imagine that we have something like IST with an end token. Now, if we do this longer or shorter, we might get different combinations of characters like this. And we can also say that there are variants. In the example that I've got here, I've got this end token that is special, but you can also imagine a variation of this where I also have a start token. But I hope that you are able to recognize that we can use a heuristic like this to select not all of the possible n-grams to train embeddings on, but we can take a very small subset. And it's this very small subset that might actually help us to keep memory down while still learning and still summarizing a lot of what the language might provide in terms of meaning. Now, the main idea that I've presented here, that is something that is central in the notion of a byte pair embedding. It's a type of embedding that does its best to keep things lightweight. Because byte pair embeddings, as well as fast text embeddings, both encode subwords to derive what the meaning of a word is, I figured it might be fun to wrap up this video by demonstrating how the languages differ. Because bipair embeddings tend to focus on specific word segments, they do end up learning slightly different patterns. And I figured it'd be nice to demo how what lies can help us understand this. So the first thing that I figured would be fun to check is to say, well, let's take this ology as a word, and let's give that to the byte pair embedding language, as well as the fast text language. And let's just check what vectors are the most similar if we were to give this as a query. And it does look like there are some differences. The byte pair embedding looks at this ology and recognizes that it is the ending of a word probably having to do with some sort of science. So we get these word endings that are the most similar. While fast text, it doesn't really focus so much on the part of the word when it sees this. In this particular case, it is still able to recognize that, oh yeah, uh, there might be an entire word that's a bit more similar here. So it immediately goes to science and biology, which I would argue is not a bad choice, but we already see that there's a difference between how both embeddings handle this similarity. Now, as a final test, I figured it will be interesting to show you what would happen if we give it a word that doesn't exist. Something like zergling mitosis. Now, what I find interesting about this example is because we have this osis at the end, you could plausibly assume that it's probably about a disease. However, because this is a very long word and because zergling mitosis doesn't exist at all, we might have this opportunity that the byte pair language will focus in on the part that it does recognize, while the fast text language tries to make sense of everything else that's in the word. So let's see what happens. And indeed, we get our confirmation. All the examples here seem to be about diseases and diagnoses and things that I would associate with a hospital. What we see here in fast text 
is that this capital letter is just confusing it just a bit, and that this part of the word is just being taken into account even though you could argue that it doesn't have to. Now in this case you could argue that it's the capital letter that's confusing us, so let's turn this into a lowercase letter to see what we get. And indeed we get more appropriate behavior, but it's still not perfect. Yes, disease is in here now, but things like Brian and Colonel do indicate that it's really focusing on other parts of the word as well, which the byte pair embedding seems to be able to escape. Now I hope that this example is intriguing to you, and you might be asking, well, how can I explore these byte pair embeddings further? Well, first of all, they are implemented inside of what lies, so you can already play with that. But if you're interested, there is also a Python package called bpemb, which offers subword embeddings for byte pair encodings. These are available, and you can download them ahead of time. And one of the things that's amazing about them is that they are available in over 270 languages. Now, if you scroll down all the way to the bottom of the documentation page, you will see all the different languages that are at our disposal. And what you can do is you can click a language, and you will find that for different vocabulary sizes of subwords, as well as for different dimensions of embeddings, you can download the binary files, so there's a lot of experimentation that you can do. But what we've also done is we've started an open source project where we allow byte pair as well as fast text embeddings to be used from Raza. A while ago, I started this Raza NLU examples project with the goal that you can more easily try out different embeddings for different languages. You can think of this project kind of like a contrib project, so we can host some more experimental features here that don't have to go through the same vetting process as Raza Core. At the time of making this video, we have a couple of features in here, mainly fast text and byte pair, but you can imagine in the future that we will have more useful NLU components, and you're also more than welcome to share some if you have some interesting ideas. And it deserves to be mentioned that the first version of the byte pair embeddings that we've got available here wasn't written by me, but by a community member. Thanks again, Julian. The main reason why I figured mentioning byte pair here is relevant is because they are available in many different languages, including some of the less common ones. So feel free to experiment with byte pair embeddings in your pipelines and let us know if they work out well for your language.